from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. I'm Shale Khan, and this is Catalyst. A lot of people's first thought about transmission is, oh yeah, that's pretty important too, but it's impossible, so why waste our time? And I, I strongly disagree with that because we, we did it and, and we know how to do it. Transmission, interconnection, congestion. Oof. Let's face it, environmental news is often very depressing. That's why we focus on solutions on this podcast. But still, the climate crisis looms large. Rising temperatures, mounting pollution, environmental degradation, they're all warping the planet. And for a lot of species, including us, things don't always look so great. But the story doesn't end there. Every Friday, Living Planet, a show from Deutsche Welle, takes you behind the headlines to figure out what's happening and how we'll get through it. It'll also help you make better choices for a healthy planet and find space to reconnect with the beauty and wonder of the world around us. You can find Living Planet wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Shail Khan. I invest in revolutionary climate technologies at Energy Impact Partners. Welcome. So the four horsemen of the decarbonization apocalypse, so to speak, at least in my humble opinion, are transmission, 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 and transmission. There's basically just no way that we decarbonize the grid, and by extension, no way that we decarbonize a bunch of other things through electrification without both building a boatload of new electricity transmission and improving the ways that we manage and plan for it today. Even in a much more immediate sense, transmission has become kind of an albatross for clean energy. Congestion costs are rising. Interconnection costs and timelines are getting pretty wild. We actually have more wind and solar currently sitting in the interconnection queue right now than we have total power generation capacity of all kinds in the entire country. Think about that for a second. And it's one of these extremely complicated, intractable problems that nevertheless deserves way more attention than I think we generally give it in climate circles. And when I say we, I definitely do not mean Rob Gramlich, the guest of today's episode. Rob is the founder and president of Grid Strategies, and he gives transmission an appropriate level of attention, which is to say a lot, like really a lot. So let's hear from him. Rob, welcome. Great to be here. Thanks, Joe. I'm excited to have you and to talk about transmission. So I think it'd be useful to start with maybe some historical context about transmission in the United States. What has our build rate on transmission been like over the years? Like, how has it changed? Obviously, there was a period of an enormous amount of transmission build out as we were first building out the backbone of the network. But, like, you know, walk me through the kind of medium to long arc of transmission history here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do 50 years in 50 seconds here. So, um yeah, in like the 70s, uh, there was a big transmission build out. You had remote, uh, big central station coal, mine mouth coal and other plants. And earlier prior to that, you had the hydro connecting hydro to loads. And th- those were the really the long distance transmission. And then the, the rest was sort of connecting utility to utility. So we've got, you know, we, the industry grew up with 3000 or so independent utilities. They were kind of balkanized little fiefdoms and they would do their own generation transmission distribution. Then for reliability, they would get some connections between them. And that was our transmission network um, overlaid with occasional long distance uh, hydro connections or coal connections and the occasional random uh, Pacific DC intertie connecting the Northwest to California. Uh, then for years, we did nothing. The 70s, 80s, 90s, beginning of 2000s, barely any transmission built. Can I pause for a second there? Why Why did we do nothing over that period? Is it because we had built out what we needed and there wasn't demand, or was it actually bottlenecks? Yeah, I mean, largely, you know, you know, load growth had been up to 7% a year, and then it was f- relatively flat in those latter, dec- in those, uh, latter decades of the last century. Um, and we also, um, uh, you know, there was some excess generation capacity, so there wasn't a lot of build out to connect new generation until right around the turn of the century. And we had that big flood of natural gas, mainly combined cycle uh, entry. And they didn't need a lot of transmission. 
But we did have uh, a little bit of an uptick in transmission then because, the, you know, we were trying to, the nation was trying to support competitive power markets and we had restructuring. Uh, and there was, when we restructured, we found out, uh, well, there's a lot of congestion on the grid and congestion is harmful for markets and it creates market power in local zones where generators have market power. So there was some build out then in the early 2000s to remedy that. Um, uh, and then uh, the next phase was sort of 2008 to 13, where there was a pretty significant build out, mainly wind energy driven, MISO multi value projects. People, your listeners probably heard about ERCOT, competitive renewable energy zones, CREZ. Um, taken together, those led to roughly 4,000 miles of high voltage, meaning like 345 kV and above. Um, trend lines built in the year, just in the year 2013, which it had been, you know, big, was a big increase from prior years and, you know, maybe a record going at least for a few decades. Uh, but then after that build out, it kind of died down again. Uh, there's a variety of causes. Uh, a lot of people attribute the unintended uh, consequences of FERC Order 1000. Uh, but also, you know, solar came in and cheaper. So if you wanted to do the next slug of renewables, you could kind of do more local solar. You didn't have to do remote solar or wind. Uh, and gas prices had dropped, uh, right? So with the um, shale gas, you could do local gas generation. So for the last decade, there really wasn't much. And, and kind of now it's dried up to a trickle. Like we're down in the, you know, couple of hundred miles of high capacity. So less than 10% of what we did a decade ago. And that's kind of where we are. Yeah. And so it's, I think what's interesting about that, you know, if you just take the sort of two periods that you described of, of higher level build out in the seventies, we built out a lot, a lot. And then and then it went dry. It sounds like you're saying it went dry after that, largely because it, there wasn't demand. Load growth had slowed down, and you know we had excess generation. So that wasn't necessarily a problem. It was just we didn't need a whole lot more at the time. Uh, that, that's fair. I mean, those of us who were thinking, well, we need to continue the clean energy growth, and we're you know to decarbonize. We need to keep this going. You know, we were we were, we were a small minority vo- voice over the last decade. Well, but then, but right, but so then around the 2008, 2013 period, we, I think this is what a lot of people forget now, because we think about the situation we're in today, which we're going to talk about, which is, which is not building much at all and clearly needing a lot more in the coming decades. And you sort of forget that actually we did build out quite a lot a decade ago. Um, and, but in this case, that dried up partially because maybe we didn't need it in an immediate sense, but this time I think there's less of an excuse because it was pretty clear we were going to need a lot more sometime in the near future, right? Uh, that's exactly right. I, I completely agree. And uh, the nice thing to um, you know about the success of a decade ago is is that it, it does show we can do this. Like a lot of people first thought about transmission is, oh yeah, that's pretty important too, but it's impossible. So why waste our time? And I, I strongly disagree with that because we we did it. Uh, and and we know how to do it. Okay, so there's just a lot of threads to unravel with when it comes to transmission. I want to try to get a clear handle on what exactly is the problem? Why is it that we are struggling to build out more? But also not just build out. The way that I think about transmission, you could tell me if I'm missing something here, is that you've kind of got three interrelated challenges. The first two having to do with the existing network and challenges that are presented on the existing network, and then the third being about expanding the network. So the, the first two are congestion, transmission congestion on the, on the existing grid, the second being interconnection, getting new resources connected to the existing grid, and then the third, of course, is build-out of the network. So, so let's talk through those one by one, starting with congestion. So how big a problem is congestion on the existing transmission network, how expensive is it and for whom? Sure. Uh, yeah, there are some current symptoms of l- limited transmission capacity and congestion and curtailment of uh, renewable projects um, are among those. And congestion is basically when uh, there is limited capacity to, del- to deliver from point A to point B on the network. Uh, in wholesale power markets, that's often reflected by a higher price on the 
uh, uh, you know, delivery, the uh, endpoint side of, of that, and uh, and a lower price on the source side. So the generator is getting a low price, the load is paying a high price, um, and uh, that's a cost. That's a that's a cost. You know, split between the the, the generation and the and the load. Um, and we're seeing that rise. Uh, it doubled. We just put out a grid strategies report saying it, uh, finding it doubled from 2020 to 2021. And pretty soon we'll get 2022 data. Anecdotally, I'm hearing from renewable generators that it's, it's rising, uh, still more. And, and this is not surprising because it's kind of cyclical. After we built that, uh, slug of transmission 10 years ago, we had had congestion and curtailment and then it declined significantly. For about five years, uh, you know, because we kind of got ahead of the problem with transmission, but then, you know, we've been lagging on transmission development. So now, um, uh, you know, the generation and load are catching up. And then, and now all of that, of course, on steroids with, uh, the EV and electrification incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act and the generation incentives, we're going to be you know, putting a lot more both supply and demand on, and we're going to have a much more constrained grid, I think, for a good five years. And and then depending on how long it takes us to build transmission, uh, it, it could last longer. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the broader point, right? Why why is this like a existential challenge for decarbonization? It's sort of exactly what you described. We're simultaneously going to be trying to build a, just an enormous volume of new, largely renewables, but new clean energy, uh, both because we need to decarbonize the grid and because the economics sort of look good in thanks in part to tax credits and the IRA. Uh, so we're going to be building out all this new generation. It happens to be the kind of generation that generally needs. Uh, it, it's not going to all be distributed. And then and then we're going to be adding who knows how much more load, but we're going to be adding load through electric vehicles, through heat pumps, through data centers, maybe through green hydrogen, maybe through direct air capture, right? We've got all these categories of load growth. So with that world of, you know, flat load for that we've had for the past couple of decades are is is clearly in the past. So you add those two things together and there's sort of no way it doesn't result in more congestion unless you build out the network. But I just want to make sure I'm clear on a number that you stated. You found that congestion costs doubled from 2020 to 2021 over one year? Over one year, doubled, yep. That's sort of extraordinary. Was that... Yeah, now there is, uh, you know, there's a little bit of noise, like, you know, gas prices or, you know, a warm or cold winter. Thing, you know, different things can can affect that. But that is the trend. It is it is going up. Uh, and and um, we are kind of hitting an inflection point. I mean, I won't, you know, when we look back in a few years, I, I won't be surprised to see it look kind of like a hockey stick rather than a, you know, a smooth... Uh, uh, upward line just because you kind of get to the capacity of the grid and then you're out. Like when you're out, you're out. And if there's no headroom, congestion costs uh, go up very high pretty quickly. So absent, let's just assume for a second, we don't build out sufficient new capacity to alleviate that congestion. And we see that hockey stick, like what what happens then? I guess the result, the natural result of that is we kind of stop building new new generation and at the same time, retail prices shoot upward. Is that like the scenario you could picture? Yep, that's right. Consumers pay the cost, um, and uh, renewable generators and their investors take a beating in in markets. Um, we're seeing that now in some regions like SPP. There's a fair amount of curtailment in California, uh, some in MISO in the Midwest, um, and uh, it, it's very hard for them. Especially, it's just hard to predict. Um, the the prospect of modeling is usually not very good because in reality the you know the lines are not all in service and there's a lot more congestion in reality or looking backwards than there usually is in in prospective modeling so it's very frustrating for investors in particular to um, you know estimate so that's that's uh, you know likely likely what we'll see has there been any movement toward alternative ways to alleviate congestion for example putting energy storage strategically placed on the transmission network to alleviate congestion? Does that have a prospect for you? Sure. Uh, yeah, there, I think there are really important opportunities along those lines. Uh, you know, not to mention also just, I think, um, you know, smaller renewable generation sites and occasional distribution level connections and things like that. I think there's 
going to have to be a, a lot of sort of smart placement of projects that fit on little spots on the grid and everybody will be looking at the, you know, the bulk power version of hosting capacity, you know, where, where can you fit generation? But also, as you mentioned, uh, storage as transmission could be very helpful. Essentially a battery on either end of a constraint can, can function as a transmission line. And then there's a set of grid enhancing technologies like topology optimization, power flow control, dynamic line ratings that all can uh, deliver more over existing wires using you know monitoring and control technologies on the on the grid and those are usually very quick to deploy and and much cheaper than other other options so I, I think there is a um, a great opportunity for those the challenge as you and your listeners know is is utility incentives on there we love our utilities our utilities love their capital and the rate base. They don't love quite so much cheap things that can solve problems without a lot of capital on the rate base. So that's the problem with uh, grid enhancing technologies. So we've got some things that have their challenges, but can help to some degree to alleviate the congestion problem, but not to solve it, I think, especially given how much new build is coming and how much new load is coming. There's sort of no, there's no future where we don't have rising congestion costs overall in the absence of new transmission build out. Do you agree with that? Correct. I agree. Okay. All right. So congestion is problem number one. Now let's get to problem number two, which is interconnection. Uh, And you hear a lot about this now. I I think this is, to me, this is actually fast becoming maybe the most immediate and acute problem that we've got, which is the ability of a new source of generation or energy storage for that matter to connect to the grid is is taking longer and becoming more expensive. So can you put some context or some numbers to what it looks like to try to interconnect these days? Sure, a couple of numbers. So interconnection to the bulk power system used to take one or two years. Now it's over four years on on average. So it's more than doubled in terms of the the time frame of processing, uh, and the cost uh, has more than doubled as well. It used to be in the hundred dollars a kilowatt range. Now it's probably over three hundred. Sometimes up to well, it's maybe you know two to three hundred, and sometimes in places up to eight hundred or a thousand dollars. Uh, a kilowatt. So, uh, and what's happening here is generators are asked to pay not just for sort of the driveway to connect to the grid, the gen tie generator tie line, but the deeper network upgrades that that um, are needed for them to be fully deliverable. And so, if you if you think about you know building a you know a, a new house on the current you know road system you pay for your driveway but then you're also being asked to pay for like a road that might be you know four blocks away or five miles away and you might be the you know the straw that broke the camel's back triggering the need for that upgrade and so you're you're asked to pay for that which um you know has some economic uh, elegance to it but uh, it really makes no sense for the current resource mix because what you have to do is study each individual generator for that, and then you assign you you send the bill to that generator. That generator says, "Whoa, I'm I'm not going to pay for that upgrade that, by the way, benefits every generator after me and all my competitors." Uh, so I'm going to drop out of the queue. Okay, well now what happens? Now the System operator has to restudy everybody else in the queue because you dropped out, uh, and then there's this great shuffling. And now, now the the nation's the limited set of transmission engineers are tied up doing endless studies and restudies rather than actually planning the transmission system. So it, it's a it's a complete process disaster, and and everybody's well aware of it at the regional transmission organizations and FERC and all that, and there's plenty of reform efforts uh, going on and, and different varieties. We've got a lot of ideas we've proposed uh, into that, but you know some of the ideas are, are, are just obvious because it, we're, the, the problems are, are so acute and, and obviously flawed. That was going to be one of my, you sort of half answered one of my key questions, which has always been, I hear about the interconnection queues getting longer and longer and the timelines getting longer and the costs getting higher. But for me, at least the like, what, what happens, what's causing all that is a bit of a black box. Maybe we could walk through like a 
more concrete imaginary example. So if I'm, let's just say I'm trying to build a solar project somewhere and I want to connect it to the bulk power system. So I file my interconnection request. What happens between that and then getting an approval? Yeah, well, you file your interconnection request with the transmission provider, which could be a regional transmission organization or just a vertically integrated utility. Either way, they study your project. Um, and uh, they're also studying you know, scores of other projects that you know, might be in a similar area, which uh, just stopping right there, that's very different from 20 years ago when, when we at FERC, I worked for the chairman of FERC at the time, when we put these rules in place, all anybody was building was gas plants, and you you know you'd have like a very you know small discrete set of gas plants, and they'd be usually connecting to the high voltage grid, and it, it wasn't there just wasn't a lot to process then. Now you've got against you know dozens or scores of projects, uh, and they all interrelate to each other, whether some are assumed to be on or others you know not proceeding. Uh, so you have this kind of complicated. Um, uh, set of uh, conditions to to study. Uh, you know, it, in theory, you're supposed to just file your request. They tell you, okay, here's what it costs. Here's the facility study, and and uh, and then you get that, and you decide, okay, I'll proceed. And then you pay them the money, and uh, you you connect, and you get your uh, your interconnection agreement, um, which is like a you know a, in FERC approved tariffs in terms of what the agreement looks like and that's like a contract um, the, the problem is just the, the complexity of these studies and restudies and how every project influences every other project um, and uh, to me the, you know and the, this whole thing used to be easier simpler and cheaper when the grid had some headroom right because there weren't projects that were the straw breaking the camel's back now like every project is Breaking another camel's back, and so it's just it it's just kind of blown up into a completely unworkable process. And so, um, you know, we can talk about solutions, but um, you know, an obvious one if you're kind of looking at this thirty thousand foot level is to say, wait a minute, why are we trying to actually build the regional network through a generator by generator, you know, serial? interconnection process. Shouldn't we just build that network that we everybody knows needs to be built uh, first? And then, you know, then it's simpler, easier, and cheaper for the generators to just connect. In other words, you would just say like, okay, we're gonna build, we're gonna build a line from from A to B. Uh, and then now get get in line generators and we can fit, you know, a certain amount of capacity on this line. And so we're gonna put everybody in up to this line and it's very straightforward, as opposed to the generators saying, hey, I wanna put a generator here. And then we do a million studies and restudies to determine the cost to each one of them of whatever the network build out is gonna to have to look like. Exactly. It's almost too obvious. But that's yeah, that's the answer. Is proactively plan the grid first and then then plug in. Doesn't mean the generators pay zero. You know, they can pay some fee. Uh, and that fee might be different in one zone of the grid versus another zone, but uh, it's you know there's much less generator specific analysis. Uh, it's just you know that that is just kind of simple and done at the end. What is to stop us from doing it that way? Is it a FERC thing, like you said, like you need FERC needs to reform the process, or is it? Yeah, so FERC has a uh, nationwide uh, notice of proposed rule out that actually might be finalized late spring here, and it does some of these things, uh, but it it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't kind of go the full distance. Again, the the root cause is the transmission capacity, and you have to do that through transmission planning. So FERC also has a planning r rule we can talk about. Um, so either at the regional level or uh, through FERC requirements, we, we need to get to the transmission planning um, to really solve the root cause problem. I've read that, um, I think the stat is that currently in interconnection queues in the United States, there is more renewable capacity sitting in the queue than there is total electricity generation capacity in the United States. 
right now. What do you make of that? Is it is it the, one of the results of this dynamic is that your incentive is just to put as much in the queue as you possibly can, hoping that something goes through? And so as a result, we have a bunch of fluff in the queue? Or like, what's going on? Yeah, uh, well... Yes and yes, and the, to be more specific, there's about two terawatts of generation in the queue. It's almost all wind, solar, and storage. Uh, and there's uh, only about a, a terawatt and a quarter of generating capacity operating on the grid right now. So All generating capacity. Uh, of all generating capacity on the, on the grid. So um, there's, there's uh, you know, almost double. And so is all of that really going to be connected? No. I mean, a lot of the... Interconnected, interconnection requests are, are projects that you know a developer hopes they kind of get the the lucky um, you know spot on the grid where their interconnection cost is relatively low, and they'll move forward to that project. But it's kind of a crapshoot. So you know, you, even if you plan on building one project, you might file six interconnection requests and just see what you get. So there is some fishing. Going on, and you know, developers hate it. Some of my clients in the you know the solar industry and the wind industry folks they hate being called speculative projects. But um, be, you know, because they're they're sort of criticized for that, as if we should just ban speculation. But what are you what are you supposed to do if you're a developer of generation, other than you know try to file some requests and see if you get a, a better answer? Okay, so congestion getting worse quick. Interconnection, already quite bad, also continuing to get worse. So the solution is planning and build-out, clearly build-out. Um, so, I mean, I guess this is where the like everybody agrees we need to build out a ton of new transmission. Everybody agrees we're not doing it at the moment. So can you just still the challenges that we face in build-out of transmission, and also maybe in comparison to, as you've said, we've gone through periods not that long in our history where we have built out a lot of new transmission. So what changed? Sure. So I think it's helpful, again, to refer back to uh, like what success looks like. When we did it well, What? how did we do that? So in the ERCOT CREZ example and the uh, MISO multi-value projects. I'm gonna I'm gonna define that acronym. So that's the clean renewable energy zones. That was the ERCOT and ERCOT. So this is right. This was a Texas because Texas has its own grid and gets to do things its own way. Texas created the CREZ. I don't know what to call it. Program, uh, which results in a bunch of transmission build out. That's right. The radical progressives in Texas in the 2008 time frame passed a law for that. Actually, an interesting. Um, uh, you know, political alignment between uh, very conservative West Tex- Texas ranchers uh, and the environmental community. Um, but anyway, uh, in Texas and in the upper Midwest, uh, we did a couple things. We proactively planned for the future generation mix. Like people actually kind of sat down and said, okay, we expect about this much new generation to come on and about this much retirement. And here's where they are on the grid. And here's the demand we expect. And in the Midwest, there were a bunch of renewable portfolio standards that utilities needed to meet. Uh, So they said, okay, well, based on that 10 or 20 year outlook, what is the most efficient grid? And then they kind of did this co-optimization or just this determination of, well, uh, we don't want to pay for, you know, tons of transmission more than we need to get all the remote generation, you know, because it might be better to have some local generation. So there was kind of a sweet spot of the amount of local versus remote generation and balancing the cost of transmission. So then they did that, and then they assigned the costs to all the beneficiaries across all the the states, all of Texas in that case, and in the uh, Midwest, according to all the beneficiaries there. So that relatively broad allocation of costs was also critical uh, to getting it done. Ultimately, you got to you got to get the money back. There's no, there's never been a shortage of investment capital for this business, but there's a shortage of ways to get your money back when you build useful lines. So uh, in the Midwest, well, both Texas and the Midwest, you have this regional tariff because of the 
an independent system operator or regional transmission organization. So you can uh, plan through that process and then you can get the money back. And if you can plan and get the money back, uh, then you're most of the way there. Uh, the other challenge is permitting. I like to talk about the three Ps of transmission barriers, planning, permitting, and paying. So we talked about the planning and the paying. And then, of course, permitting is hard, but in that in these cases, the, they got the permits. Like, they're never easy. It take, it's a while. It takes, you know, a lot of studies. But in that MISO Midwest case, 16 out of 17 of the lines got permitted. And we can live with that kind of batting average, right? If you have a well-planned line and then you have these independent uh, expert um, RTO executives go to the planning uh, CPCN proceeding in a state and say, here's why this line is needed, you know, not every line will get permitted, but most of them will. So I, I think that's solvable. We can certainly talk about permitting legislation and ways to improve the the process. But, um, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's just not the case that we, we, you can't build anything. If, I think if you do the planning, permitting, and, and paying well, we can we can do that. And again, we we did it before. Where does local opposition fit in? Is that in the permitting bucket? In your mind, I mean, I, as I think about you know th- these stories in the past of like Clean Line, for example, and trying to build out all, all this transmission that was that was such a big challenge. I think of local opposition ending up being one of the major, and that sort of bleeding up into politics and permitting and a bunch of other stuff being one of the death knells for some of those lines. So, is, is that how do you how big a problem do you think of that as being? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, a lot of these lines are are really out in rural areas, and if you can get the landowners to agree with their lease payment, then you can get the lease agreement, and you know you can string together contiguous plots of land to um, to build the line. So the, there's a lot certainly on the developer uh, to do in terms of uh, you know where to route the line, which you know how to work with the communities. Uh, one little provision we got into the Inflation Reduction Act is this uh, $760 million program for uh, kind of local community economic development, sort of hosting, uh, you know, benefits for um, counties or local communities. So um, that's, uh, you know, policies like that can can help. Certainly outreach, early outreach by developers is, is critical. Um, but, you know, by and large, these lines are not going near many people. Um, it's not like, you know, citing LNG facilities in, you know, towns. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of citing process. Okay, so stepping back, do you, is your sense of where we are, I mean, I don't know, I'm torn between two things that you're saying. On one hand, if you just look at the dynamic at play sort of immediately today, it looks like it's, it's bad and getting worse, you know, congestion's bad and getting worse, interconnection's bad and getting worse. We're not building much new capacity as it stands today. And then we have all these examples of, you know, projects taking 15 years to get permitted and built and that kind of thing. So you could easily make a case that like, a semi-apocalyptic case that this, the transmission ends up being the thing that holds back the energy transition above all other things. Um, But it also sounds like you're saying, one, these problems are not insurmountable, and two, there is some progress being made at FERC. There's possible permitting reform. There's some, you know, thoughts around new planning. So, you know, where are you on the um, everything is fine to everything is screwed <laughs> axis at the moment? Yeah, I'm in the sort of, this is not rocket science. Damn it, we should do this now. And, oh, we were so close, getting some really good stuff in the 117th Congress uh, there really wasn't very much for transmission in the Inflation Reduction Act or uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. And at FERC, the drama there, um, very unfortunately, is that uh, Chairman Rich Glick, who had these great initiatives uh, that were, in my opinion, extremely well designed to, to, and tailored to the problem, uh, he is no longer there. Uh, uh, for reasons outside of electricity policy. And so now we're in kind of Never Never Land at FERC. We have these potentially great actions, but we don't know if they will pass, uh, and we don't know if maybe they'll just pass a weak form of them. Um, 
And either, you know, with or without strong FERC rules, uh, inevitably the regional consensus is going to be important. So having governors involved in this and supportive of a build out of transmission in their regions is very helpful. Usually they care a lot more about economic development, uh, whereas the, the regulators might be just sort of bean counting whether one ratepayer benefits by this much or that ratepayer. So getting broad policy support in the regions is a, uh, is a need and an, and an opportunity. Uh, and that's hard work. We don't necessarily have that yet. I, you know, there are some encouraging signs in different regions about utilities starting to look outside their footprints and f- figure maybe they'll get involved in transmission. So there are some signs of hope, but I, I do think we've got a big problem on our hands. It is getting worse. And, uh, none of the policy actions over the last two or three years have solved the problem. Like there's, Proposals and pro, you know promising proposals, but they're they're not they haven't passed and they're not in place. So we got a lot of work to do. Is there any world in which I mean you've talked about the straw that broke the camel's back in the context of a generator trying to get interconnected? But is there is there a straw that could break the camel's back here if congestion costs and interconnection costs and timelines get so bad? Like if it becomes even worse and we don't build out enough in the near term, will it be unavoidable that we'll need to do some kind of massive reform or could we just continue into oblivion? Well, I, I do think uh, reforms are happening at the regional level on interconnection and the FERC reform rulemaking is likely to proceed regardless of new commissioners coming just because like that one was actually passed on a, the proposal was passed on a bipartisan 5-0 vote at FERC. So it's sort of those process reforms are less controversial than the how do you build that build out the grid. So I, I think we'll get process reforms, both from FERC and at the regional level, that will improve the situation uh, to some extent. So hopefully that four and a half year you know average time you know will shrink maybe to, maybe to three. Uh, but you know I don't I don't expect it to solve the problem. Um, you know, more than that until we get transmission built. But I also don't expect the, the queues to get even worse than they are. I think the, there are a lot of activities to improve the, uh, the the queue processing issue. This is wild prognostication, but one thing I think about a lot. So in the, I remember in the, um, in the modeling immediately after uh, the IRA passed, the, the repeat project, Jesse Jenkins's project, estimated that by, around the end of this decade, we were going to be building out over 100 gigawatts per year of solar alone in the United States, not to mention all the wind and the batteries and all this other kind of stuff. And, and, and I think you know, economically that seems like it's right. Um, but my question, and, and I know they model this in too, but like my big question has been like, how are we going to interconnect all this stuff? Do you think it's possible or likely, I guess, that we are going to get to that point that quickly? We have to have the grid. And Jesse's project also said that I think 80% of the Inflation Reduction Act's uh, carbon reductions uh, will be lost if we don't build out the grid. And so I, I think all the modeling is, is showing the grid really is the, the constraint. If it wasn't before it, IRA, it, it is now. And so you know we really have to get busy on, uh, on building out the grid. All right, Rob, I feel like I have a somewhat better handle on exactly what's inside that black box of transmission at the moment. But I appreciate you walking me through it and uh, hopefully we'll see some progress. We can have you back on and talk about it. Well, great. And we need more talented, you know, help, uh, need more folks uh, working on this. There's plenty of work uh, in this, in this area. So, um, you know, look, look me up and, uh, you know, there's, there's organizations that are working on this, a lot of good people, a lot of good NGOs and associations, et cetera. So I hope, uh, hope folks get, uh, get uh, interested and fall in love with the grid. Rob Gramlich is the founder and president of Grid Strategies. This show is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. You can head over to canarymedia.com for links to today's topics. Postscript is supported by Prelude Ventures, a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs to address climate change across a range of sectors, including advanced energy, food and ag, transportation and logistics, advanced materials and manufacturing, and advanced computing. This episode was produced by Daniel Waldorf, mixing by Roy Campanella and Sean Marquand, theme song by Sean Marquand. I'm Shale Khan, and this is Catalyst. Catalyst.